Great. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. Our guest who's coming to join us is just having a moment to log in. But while he does, I want to throw out a question. And I'm going to start with you, Sensei Dauphin, because um, I'm competing this weekend. So are you. All of us have competed. And I think all of us have had to consider uh, what bracket we compete in. So I want to ask you, Sensei Dauphin, the benefit of cutting weight versus the benefit of competing at your walking around weight. Pros and cons. Yeah, I don't know, because uh, um, in BJJ is the first time I've had to actually make a weight. Um, in previous competitions, it was always at my rank, mm. right? Like it, yeah. So it's like, you know, when I competed in uh, Dominican and Panama and Venezuela, I was competing at a rank, not at a weight. So oftentimes the guys are were bigger. Um I've not found it really too hard to, to cut weight, to be honest with you. I'm like trying to maintain weight, but I, for this tournament in particular, I didn't say like, oh, I'm going to cut down to like this certain weight and then try and gain weight. It's just like, where am I closest to? And then yep. make sure that I come in at that weight. So that's where I am. Um, right on. But specifically, I think uh, it would be better if people just competed at their natural body weight instead of trying to cut weight, right? Seems what? to be a, a comp competition hack, right? Like, I think so too. Um, the last tournament that I did, they weighed in the day before and it was a pretty large tournament. So I did cut 10 pounds for that and I had no ill effect around it. I cut it in a week. It wasn't real tough. I, I had it to lose. Uh, but because you weighed in the day before, you could really shed and then rebuild the energy. This tournament is way in right before your first match with your gi on. And that for me is like, you really got to make sure you're coming in with proper energy. So I actually went, I was starting to cut and I realized that I would have to cut 10 pounds in five days versus being in the top third of my weight category with my gi on. So I actually opted for more energy, not to try and be the biggest guy in a smaller division. What about you, Sensei Suino? Have you ever thought about it? I don't know if you've ever cut weight for a tournament, but I need to max out the body, like crank on muscle or like, you know, how have you approached those? Yeah, all the time. You're right. I've never had to cut weight for a tournament. When I was a kid in judo tournaments, they just put us in a weight class that they thought served us. Um, and it served, always served me um, no weight classes in EIDO. So that was mm -hmm. never an issue. Um, uh, but I cut weight for things like uh, uh, presentations when I do public speaking, because um, I don't like the look. I don't like the way I look. Uh, if I'm carrying seven or 10 extra pounds on stage. Um, and I like the feeling of that week, uh, you know, of getting, trying to cut and then staying cut. Uh, uh, the only problem is you start getting weak after a while, right? You cut too much for too long, you lose strength. So it feels good. The stamina goes through the roof. You know, I can, I can roll or play judo for hours, uh, but I get, I get weak. So it's like a balance, you know? Absolutely. What about you, Hanchi? I know you guys didn't cut much weight back in the day for your fights. Did you think about nutrition the week of? Did you change anything the week of? It's a bit like Sensi Sweeno says. Uh, in, in my day, they had the lightweights, middleweights, and heavyweights. I was always in really good shape. I'm not bragging. I weighed 172 pounds almost all the time. And uh, I always fought in heavyweight division. Nobody ever questioned. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have much about that. I just suppose that uh, if you had to cut weight, you and you did it over a long period of time, you would be in better shape. But if you just had to lose it for a couple of, you know, a day or something, that may affect your your performance or your, you know, your well being. Other than that, I don't know. Yep. It's an interesting sense that I see. That's one of those things that uh, when you were competing, if you talk to any of like you, Rick Joslin, Bill Hines, Wally Slokey, everybody was always trying to get into the heavier weight. Like they all wanted to fight heavyweight, even though they might have been a middleweight or a lightweight. They were like, I'm going to just hold some plates under my armpits and stand here. <laughs> and heavier than I actually am because I want to fight the big guys <laughs> yeah, you know and it's maybe it's ego but you know everybody knows who Ali is not everybody knows who the 
light heavyweight champion of the world is. Well, at least I don't. And back in those days, we we sort of were awed by the big guys when we were coming up, you know. So it might just have been ego. A lot of times it didn't turn out that good for us, but when you did it, you felt good. And then um, let me come back to you, Sensei Dauphin. You know, we were talking about the fact that sometimes when you, you get into a tournament and maybe you're a little lighter, or a little heavier, or a little older, a little younger, you might be moved up or down a bracket. Would you rather be moved down an age bracket or up a weight bracket? Oh, man. Um, listen, anybody who's my age, who's willing to sack up and get in there and fight is probably fairly grizzled. Um, and I guess what I would say to your question is I, I could be on the day, whatever happens, happens. But if you're asking me my choice, I'd rather fight younger people who are not quite as salty as I am. <laughs> right? Like that's, yep. that's, I'd rather fight them at my weight with less experience than fight somebody um, who's, you know, a bit older than me, but also is in there like, you know, your trips around the sun mean something. Uh, how yep. many times you've gone around the sun means something. And uh, when I look at this call, it's like, you know, when I was 50 and I had to fight here, the fight I was most nervous about and the worst fight was the last fight, right? And I had to fight somebody who was 25 years older than me, which was Sense of Legacy. And still he kicked me in the kidney with a roundhouse kick that was like a crippling kick, <laughs> um, you know? And uh, that was the one I was worried about through all the other 49 fights. Oh, but I was also <laughs> super excited to do that fight too, right? Like, um, yeah. So anyway, I guess I'd rather fight my weight class younger people. Um, I feel the exact same. I mean, I spent every day training with guys who were 20 and you add on 15 pounds on someone. Uh, that's all things equal. That's a real thing. I mean, the, the Gracies down in the Academy in Torrance, they call it Boyd belts. They had this older jujitsu guy who's like 60 year old black belt. And he went to them depressed one day and he's like, man, I couldn't beat this like, you know, 25 year old purple belt. I just couldn't get him. And they went every 10 years and every 20 pounds is almost the belt equivalent. And the fact that he didn't beat you is what your black belt kind of is doing for you at this point. And I've really talked that like when someone comes in 21 jack to the gills, that's it. I mean, if they know nothing, it's okay. But if they got a bit of skill, that's still a tough role, no matter what, you know, Sensei Sweeney, I see you nodding along. What do you think? Yeah. Well, it, um, weight is a big deal in the grappling sports, right? Our uh, grappling arts, you know, judo and jujitsu, uh, jujitsu. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I remember at, at the Y we used to do, um, in-house tournaments and you just had to fight your way up the, up the ladder. Right. So you yeah. might, there might be seven guys in the dojo that are below you in rank or whatever, and they got to fight their way up when they lose. The next guy goes up through the ranks. And I remember a few Saturday mornings where I get paired with some kid that weighed 60 pounds more than me. And, uh, you know, it's like, you, there's nothing you can do about that. Right. you you try all your techniques and you look like a cartoon while they just stand there. And, uh, I remember when I got in trouble, uh, you know, I'm an 11 year old kid and I got this, uh, you know, so I, what do I weigh at the time? A like hundred pounds or something. Um, I got this 175 pound, you know, kid lying on top of me trying to, I'm trying to grapple him and I can't do anything. And I believe I may have uttered a profanity or two. And the kid, the kid, you know, he's holding me down and I can't move. And he whispers, he goes, I don't think you're supposed to swear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Hans, you already kind of talked about this, but would you rather fight a bigger guy or a younger guy if, if it really mattered? Skill equal. I don't know. I, I, there's more going on today than there was in my day. I just faced whoever they put in front of me. It was personally, I didn't do grappling, so it's probably different, right? If you were faster or you were smarter, you could possibly win the fight. But uh, like my question to Sensei Suino was just as he started to say that was, would you rather fight a lady with good skills 
or a bigger guy with not so good skills? That was going to be my question. So, but with me, it's it's a game of tank. You know, you don't have to hit the guy hard. You just have to get your hand in. Whereas uh, I didn't play those games myself. I, I like to hit them hard. And in a way, if you ask Randy, he won a championship under my advice. Um, because of that, you know, hitting hard as opposed to hitting fast. Because if you hit hard, the guy starts to slow down. So. That was one of the things, even in point tournaments uh, that were supposedly non-contact. Um, since Legacy always told me, like, Randy, you got a good roundhouse kick. Like, throw that roundhouse kick as hard and fast as you can into the middle of their body. And even if they have to block it, they're going to become afraid. They're not going to want to get hit with that. And then it's going to change the whole complexion of the fight. I did it so many times. Like, just that hard mid-level roundhouse kick as hard as I could. And even if they put both arms up, you could almost read the expression in their body language after you hit them, which was, I don't ever want to get hit with that thing clean. So then they were on the move, right? Yeah. You want to um, hurt them, you want to hurt them legally. <laughs> right? You want to hurt them legally to, to instill a type of fear. I mean, I. I saw the most brutal non-contact punch when Randy was fighting this guy. He was just a jerk. He had ripped me off for money and Randy just pounded him. I couldn't believe how they didn't disqualify him. But uh, he was saved by Fauci Martavo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, you listen, know, but- we're, diver- we're diverging around here. Another favorite technique of mine was when people held their hands too high, right? If, especially if it was a non-contact tournament to the face and they put their hands up here and you just fucking pound them in the hands as hard as they you can and then their own hands get jammed into their face and they start bleeding and the referee is going what am I supposed to do here he didn't punch you in the face he punched you in the hands and you punched yourself in the face like <laughs> that's another <laughs> yeah um, this isn't quite the same thing, but Hanchi, one of my favorite things to do is one of, one of your crane ideas right here when people are here and just just a real nice chop right there and they just don't want to block as much anymore. Sensei Suino, what, what is your answer to that question? I know my answer in grappling. Well, it's, it's, it's hilarious that Hanchi posed the question that day. I think it was on the same night in Yokohama at the Kanagawa Prefectural Dojo. Um, uh, there was a There was a big guy there that was a bit of a nemesis for me. He probably outweighed me by 50 or 60 pounds. Um, and I can't remember if I just figured it out or one of my coaches mentioned it to me, but they go, you know, the guy's feet are, are, um, are fast, but he gets, he gets himself in a narrow stance. And um, so I was feeling real proud of myself. I swept foot swept this guy and he hit the ground as hard as you can imagine. Cause he just, he, he narrowed his stance too much. And, uh, and so I finished that fight. And I went over to the sidelines and I was feeling really full of myself. And then this, you know, 18 year old girl who was like four foot seven came up to me and she goes, Hey, do you want to play judo? And I'm like, Oh, 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 yes, I do. And so we walk out there, we bow. And in like four seconds, I was on the ground looking up at the ceiling tiles. And for, for 10 minutes, I had no idea what was happening. It was one of those things where, because, you know, you had World Games and Olympic competitors showing up there. I don't know what her what her level was. Uh, I was a pretty good judo player at that time. And um, for 10 minutes, she just absolutely, I was helpless. And I, she might have weighed, uh, she might have weighed 130 pounds at most, at most. It was just speed, skill, the fact that she was so low, you couldn't really brace your arms to keep her out. And I was, she probably threw me 30 times in 10 minutes. Um, so that may be a, the, the object lesson, right? Who would you rather fight? Well, on that particular day, I'd rather fight a heavy set dude with slow with with the narrow narrow feet than a than a tiny you know a high school girl who humiliated me in front of everybody for ten minutes. Well trained. Yeah, yeah, she was so good; it was ridiculous. I mean, I know on the mats, I've never been dominated by a big guy who lacks skill, but I've been dominated by the best women in that club. Easily, it's just. It's a fact because you just you don't know where to put your hands. You don't know. 
not to cross your elbows. You don't know not to put your hands on the mat. And, and you're just, I don't care how big you are, you're giving the roadmap to someone who knows what they're doing. And, you know, a smaller person who's talented and especially more talented than me, I'm going to be giving them the roadmap. And so, yeah. You know, Ben, the thing is, it's not that uh, you don't know not to do it, but even if you do know not to do it, those more skilled people are going to make you do it, whether yeah. you want to or not. Yeah. Right. Like it's like you do stand up with a person who knows how to punch and kick. That's great. But if they know where to make you stand and they know how to make you turn your back and they know how to make you like believe that this is going to happen and then something else is going to happen, then they force you into making mistakes that even if you know I shouldn't make that mistake, they just make you make the mistake. You know, like, sorry, Sensei Sweden, go ahead. Um, well, Daniel Day Holland III is on this call. And many, many years ago, we went up to a tournament in East Lansing. And uh, one of the main guys at that tournament, I think he was a Korean uh, competitor, maybe an Olympian or, or coach or something like that. He was just so talented. And um, I watched him fight a bunch of people, including Daniel Day Holland III. And he was a master at what you just said. Uh, 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 he, he would, you know, there's a lot of guys in judo that'll fight you. This guy would set you up so that you would move in such a way that you you know you'd become vulnerable and you could just see him he was just sitting there calculating and doing the moves in real time it was gorgeous to watch yeah well you talked about the the, the best judo guy who's ever lived the, the 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 winningest judo man who's ever lived that everyone knew what he was coming with mm -hmm. and that's even less about the chess game of it but mm -hmm. it's like good luck it's still coming because of technique it's funny you say that because like for example koga who won a bunch of Olympics was extraordinary at judo. And as you say, he only had one or two techniques each, each, each set of Olympics. Right. Um, but he came in, that was, that was diabolical speed and a little innovation. Right. But you never looked at him and went, he's just out thinking everybody else. Right. He was just out athleticizing everybody else, a modern guy. Oh no. Another guy like that. Um, once in a while though, you get somebody who's just, you know, a diabolical, their, their brain is better. And that's, that's really fun to watch. Yep. And by the way, just a quick shout out to the people watching right now. You know, our guest is having a little trouble with his computer and his Zoom, and that's life. Um, feel free to chip in with your questions now. You know, if they aren't rat shit, we'll get to them. Um, so I got a question. We've only, we, we haven't had a lot of repeat guests, but I did once drop a second 10 questions. And it's a question we haven't really asked much, but let's forget about you know, we, we talk a lot about the grappling or whatever, but let's forget BJJ. Let's forget karate. Let's forget Iido. Let's start no. with you, Anchi. Like you say, we won't forget that. Absolutely not. <laughs> let's forget. I already hate this question. <laughs> Anchi, forgetting those ones, because we know you've mentioned maybe if, if you were, you know, younger, you might try the grappling, but what's another art you would have loved to have explored or, or if you had more all the time in the world, you'd go, I'm curious about this one. Judo. Judo. Yeah, that, that's why I was really interested when you said that. That that's got to be a, a complete Zen art. That's what I was. The frame of mind you have to have. It's not about hitting the target. It's about um, doing the moves and being in the right mind. And um, I'm only guessing at that. The person to ask would be Sensi Squino because he has actually done that art. And I was really curious about it. The, so my question in a sense would be to Sensi Squino, was it important to hit the target? <laughs> well, <clears throat> that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, I found Kudo really difficult, um, mm -hmm. both emotionally, right, to settle down enough to do it, but also technically. It was just, it was just a lot harder than you'd think. Um, uh, you know, when you do a kata, you're not trying to knock somebody's block off, and yet you do millions and millions of kata to get good at, at, at your art. In kudo, they're trying to train you to do a very specific set of steps one after another in a very particular way. So yes, you know, the, hitting the target is not important, but at some point you're good enough that you hit the target all the time. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never done it, so I I wanted to know if did, did they count that or is that part of their judging of your ability? Well, it, it it depends on your teacher. So I trained at a place that was a little bit more Zen oriented. And so they wanted you to 
you know, they wanted to address your internal issues. They want to make sure your technique was good and everything. But when it came down to get a rank, they just said, oh, we don't rank here. Go down to the municipal center. They're doing a giant kudo test on October 5th. And 300 of us went down there. And their methodology was for us beginners, if you hit the target once, you get showed on. If you hit the target twice, you get knee on. <laughs> so it was as superficial as you could get at that point. <laughs> So Sensei Suino, what about you? If 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 the arts you're familiar with don't exist or yet, what, what what would you like to try or have tried? Oh if my you're gosh! Empire with infinite ears. I love martial arts. Um, the first one that came to mind is Muay Thai. Uh, I think it'd be really fun to to train in Muay Thai and to go to Thailand and train in one of those one of those gyms. The way that watching those guys train, they're just beasts. Um. But other than that, I don't know that I've met a, a heritage martial art that I didn't like, right? You know, I don't like a cobbled together martial art that, you know, some guy in Missouri did. Um, but if it's if it's Muay Thai, it's from, from the Filipino arts, uh, even if it's European, right? Catch wrestling is fascinating. There's just, I have never met a martial art I didn't like. Mm -hmm. Sensei Dofa? I mean, I'll mention a couple. I I would really, Muay Thai is something that would be very interesting uh, because of the Thai heritage. It would be really interesting to, to learn that martial art. Um, again, it's based on history, right? Like pancreat would be a really cool martial art to delve into. But honestly, the one that rises to the top of the list for me, Sean, because of who I am and it won't probably surprise you, It'd be really cool to delve into capoeira. Mm. I would, I would really like the history of that martial art, like the country that it's from, the way they had to disguise it. It seems to me very much like Okinawa, right? Where they were, they had to do things in secrecy. They had to hide it um, in order to be able to practice it. And they hid it in a certain way. It'd be really cool to do capoeira. And I also like the athleticism of it, right? Like I just, really like the athleticism of capoeira yeah right on i'm, I'm cheating a little bit mine just because they're really we're, i'm already touching on them with everything i do but just pure boxing i would love to just pure box um you know tie those ankles together and practice all that stuff um and sometimes you know if i could go back to high school i'd join wrestling um nothing would make me happier than if i got rebooted I'd just be like, volleyball was fun, but we're going to wrestle and we're going to figure out what that all looks like and that intensity of training. <laughs> you're about to get, you uh -oh. know, get it's ninja. Out of, you get got ninjas ninja. at your house. I know, Jesus. <laughs> we're in Montreal. What about They're you? sneaky. <laughs> I love it. That never oh. happened. Yeah. It's yeah, we've all traveled so much doing this that it's bound to happen. <laughs> it was so it was so so stealthy since I like, see. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so so, yeah. Which makes <laughs> me suggest that maybe we should have taken ninjutsu. <laughs> so this That's is a an, great yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's another art that is really um, you know, ninjutsu, everybody thinks they're great this and they're great that. They may be, but really it's uh, a ninja is like a modern day spy. They set things up like, you know, when they get chased, they've already set something near a high fence. When somebody is chasing them, they've set up a little springboard so they can spring over a high wall. But when the people get there, they see it, but they don't have to run, you know, to jump the wall. You understand what I'm saying? They, they'd have to back up and then run by that time the guy's gone. Or uh, they make this um, powder that they throw onto the ground and it explodes into a bomb of smoke. And then you're looking around and you're going, where did they go? They've actually been there, dug a hole, made this special ash that doesn't blow away and they just jump into it and it goes up over their heads and they just don't know who the person is, but he's just, he's just right there. So uh, that would be an interesting art to learn all those different ways of fooling people. 
So let's let's get into that because I was actually going to segue into that, Hanshi, when, when when we made that joke. Is what about the? I mean, that that thinking and that espionage. That's that's incredible. What do we know about the actual core fighting underneath that for ninjas? I would I, I couldn't really tell you, but um, you know they do a sword art, but I've never seen a ninja ever challenge Miyamoto Musashi. You know if you know what I'm saying. So they would be good, and there may be some that would be excellent, but. I'm not quite sure what to tell you there, whether, of course, TV makes it look like they're the best warriors of all, but they're really sneak thieves, right? They sneak around and, and get you that way. That's why um, the shoguns and that, the floorboards and the castles were always creaking and, you know, they always set up certain things so the ninjas couldn't sneak in and slit their throats during the night. So it's... You would say they're good with their knives. I'd say they were good with getting in and getting you when you're not expecting it, getting by your guards. So it's a little bit more like that. I think people misunderstand ninjutsu a little bit in modern day. They just think that ninjas are good at everything, which may be true, but maybe we'll get asked somebody else. And yeah, we should ask Stephen K. Hayes when he was. We had the most uh, famous modern ninja on our show. <laughs> we should ask him that question. What yeah. I would say, Sean, uh, if I could chime in, like, what do we know about their fighting skills? They were willing to fight. They had a strategy and they were going to put themselves in a harm's way to do damage to somebody. So they weren't like passive or weak about it. It's not like, you know, they weren't being picked off the sidewalk saying, Hey, you look like you're pretty tough. Can you go in this dangerous place, climb this wall, get past all these guards, kill this person, and get yourself back out? They must have had some level of skill. Right. <laughs> I agree with that. But again, none of them has ever faced me with Masashi. And that's just, I keep using that same guy. So you don't really know if they had all top skills or all really good skills you know what i mean yeah I, that's why i'm asking what level say compared to miyamoto musashi would they be so, so if you compared them to miyamoto musashi sensei miyamoto musashi was infamous for not following the rules of engagement in japan he was infamous for that and so were ninjas mm -hmm. they didn't follow the rules of engagement they didn't announce themselves they didn't so that's I'm what just, I'm saying. Yeah. They're um, sneak teams. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I love the idea. It's like, oh, my smoke bomb didn't go off. Now I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Shit. I should have packed that smoke bomb better. <laughs> I'm not trying to belittle them. I'm just asking questions to get the thing rolling. Mm -hmm. Are you going to announce, Benz? I don't know if you saw the message from uh, Robert, but. Uh... This is now uh, officially a host chat. Uh, since Kelly, his computer has died. It's good. Like we've gone four years without having this happen, right? We've gone all this time, hundreds of episodes without anybody ever not showing up. Um, tonight we make history on PKCC where the guests, their computer died and they couldn't get in. And I don't know. Maybe that's divine intervention because we haven't done a host chat in a while and it's already so much fun to just be chatting. <laughs> okay, it is fun. Right yeah. It has been a sec. Does anyone got anything? I, I actually had an opening question for him that I think we could get into, but it's not well, very urgent. We were talking about competition. So I'd like to talk um, about, so since the already talked about the smallest person he fought, that, that young seven-year-old who destroyed him. <laughs> I don't think there were actually seven, but um, who's the biggest, who's the smallest that uh, you had to face and how was it? Just curious. How about you, Benz? We'll start with you since I'm asking the question. Can you think of the biggest and the smallest? Um, I, I, is it okay if we go outside of competition? I don't care. I mean, 
there's there's a couple guys in my jujitsu class and Mondays and when uh, Fridays are the you warm up for 12 seconds and you just roll. And there's one guy there. He's not the biggest guy, but he's a former semi-pro rugby player. I'm going to log him in at 260 and he knows what he's doing. And it's just a bitch every second of it. And so it's not a competition, but we're definitely trying to tap each other out. And we had this period where I could hold him off because I was my, my defense was decent. And then he started doing some privates. <laughs> and in those privates, he learned a couple pathways um, that weren't always apparent in the basic classes. And I love rolling with them, but it never goes my way. And it's, it's 260 pounds. I mean, that's half my weight on top of my weight. And a guy who knows what he's doing and has the muscle underneath and played fucking rugby. So it's like... None of this is an issue for him whatsoever. Um, and then in terms of like, dudes, there's this guy who's about 130 pounds and he's skilled as fuck, but it's 130 pounds. So I get to do to him what that guy does to me because I'm half his weight above him. In terms of stand up, I don't have any significant biggers or smallers um, other than even Alden, my own student who, you know, he's 210. He's built like a fucking like Mack truck with speed and uh he's what six two six three fighting him just gets tougher every week and it's one of the best things for my martial arts but we've never competed but the man keeps me on my toes and I love it and I never hate it but it can suck for me at times when when I get backed up and he just throws that long loose range shit so it's not quite a competition answer but Th those yeah, are real. Well, it doesn't have to be competition. Just yeah. anybody. That's a great answer. Yeah, those are real. Big, small. I know you've got some huge guys who come to JMAC that you've rolled with. And I know you've got, like, you know, Daniel Holland. Like, so I'm just curious your thoughts on big, small. Like, yeah. Well, a lot of examples. Um, uh, one that that both of you guys, Sean and Randy, I think uh, met may have rolled with not at the crucible we just did, but the crucible prior to that. Remember, we had two or three guys in blue uniforms uh, who trained at a a, a, a regional uh, BJ Day school. And one of the guys was like six four, and honestly, I I, I handled everybody at that. Um, I handled everybody at that crucible except the two guys. I really had to fight my buddy Justin, and then this other guy whose name I can't remember. I couldn't do a thing with him. His arms were so long. He would just hold your arms out like this and did something with his feet, some kind of rubber guard. And I, mean, I went back after him 20 times and I couldn't do a damn thing with him. But 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 the scariest guy I ever faced was a guy in Yokohama. Uh, about once a month, the Yokohama Corrections Department judo team would come and train in our dojo. And these guys had no sense of humor. You know, the way they run the jails in, in Japan, they're very, they're very, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? They're very straight. They're no nonsense. You know, the prisoners have something to do every minute of the day. Uh, there's there's no fooling around. And the guards are dead serious. They were all good judo players. But one of the guys, um, I think he had like, you know what gigantism is, you know? He, I mean, like, like really big brow ridge, giant elbows and knees. The guy was all of seven feet tall. And you looked in his eyes and did not see any signs of intelligence whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> he was a very nice man but he was giant and he had a tayatoshi if you know what that is right you turn and you stick one leg out in front of the guy and flip it over and pretty much at will i mean certainly he could throw me because i was half his size but he could throw almost everybody in that dojo with the exception of two or three really big really talented guys and he was just like something out of a cartoon he was just such a massive human being he had one judo technique and it worked every single time <laughs> Sense of legacy, big and small. I I don't know what to tell you there. I I um, Pearson was big. Pearson was big, yeah, and so was Sato. Uh, but Billy Hines wasn't big, <laughs> and he was maybe my size or smaller. So I I really don't have any preference. The bigger guys though have that reach, you know, and they if if you just try to go straight in at them, they're gonna just have their hand out there, and it's hard to go around. But 
I, I, I can't answer that because I don't do uh, groundwork. You know, I, I mean, not serious like you guys. Hachi, Hachi uh, you always speak with such reverence about Bill Hines. What was it about his fighting that that was so uh, that made him, you know, that 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 gives you gives you so much respect for the way he fought? Uh, that would be almost hard for me to answer because of like I've only been roughed up maybe two times in all the time that I fought, and I lost uh, uh, because he was my senior. He was uh, and. He would always help train me. And um, we fought one time for a Canadian championship. Uh, we went into three overtime rounds. And um, we were, one was just as fast as the other. And all of a sudden, he just wound up with his punch. I blocked really fast. And he just reached out and touched me with like a slow motion punch. <laughs> Shit. And I just stood there with my jaw touching my chest going, you know, so, uh, uh, and it's, it's not because he beat me, but it's because I watched him fight other times and he was a small guy uh, with a big man spirit. Like he, he was scary, everybody was afraid. I don't know. I just, mm. you know, there's some guys that that impress you. It doesn't matter their size. It's just he was a good martial artist, and a, and again, a student of Benny Allen's. Back to you, Ben's. Right on. I just like letting that echo because he was one of our guests and one of our friends, and um. So I don't want to take too much away from uh, the interview we will have with Sensei Kelly, but he talks a lot in, in, if you ever look up what he's about, about mental health, about having been suicidal, PTSD, that kind of thing. And then he's, he's got this quote, you know, get busy living. And I want to talk about what that means for each of you. And I want to talk about why martial arts is something that has been for you or can be for others. Uh, not like life-saving in a way that's not physical. Um, let's start with you, Sensei Suino. <laughs> I could talk for hours on this, 100%. Uh, if martial arts didn't save my life, it's given me my life. Um, holy cow, this... To be able to... So I've, I've got, I don't know what to call it. I've got some weird form of, of, you know, ADHD or, or something not diagnosable, but my attention span is very short and I've done a lot of things in life, which is me. It's been a blessing, but I've done one thing consistently since I was eight years old, other than the three years that I spent doing gymnastics, I've always done martial arts and I've not only just done it, but I've always consistently gotten better over time. Uh, technically, Got, gathered more people around me who are more skilled, built them up, built schools. Uh, it's the core of who I am, but more importantly, it's not like, uh, it's not, you know, let's say you, you're a bowler and you just go and recreationally bowl every Thursday night. Uh, it could be that if you pursue it with that passion, but being able to get better and having it become more complex physically, mentally over time. Um, has given me license to go into many other activities. It drives who I am professionally. It drives who I am in my relationships. Um, it gives me the courage to go, do great adventures uh, because uh, many times when you step into the dojo, it's a great adventure. And you not only s survive it, but you thrive, you get better, and you build lifetime friendships along the way. Um, get busy living. Martial arts has made it possible, but for me to live a big life mm. uh, uh, and mostly live into my more positive attributes instead of live into my weaknesses, which in my 20s, I was in danger of living into instead. Thanks, Sensei. Um, what about you, Sensei Dolphin? Where do you go with the mental health aspect, the get busy living, and what is that for you? Well, I don't I've alluded to it lots of times. Uh, only probably the three of you on this call know 
you know, my background is my parents, my mom and dad were like really poor people. Like, and they came from very big families where there was lots of substance abuse. Like everybody, bad drug users, bad alcohol users. And a lot of people were um, involved in crime. And I was a very insecure person when I was young. So if that's a mental health disease, that's de definitely I lived in fear for a long time and just pretended that I wasn't afraid. Um, agreeing with everything that Sensei Suino just said, like every single thing he just said is true of me as well. Um, I really like uh, the adventure thing that he said, like martial arts is taking me to some of the craziest places with confidence that you could possibly go, right? Like since Legacy and I have been in Vancouver walking into abandoned buildings together and I never felt afraid and I felt confident to go ahead and do that. Um, I've been to Japan, I've been to Okinawa, I've been to Venezuela, I've been to the Dominican Republic, I've been to Panama. Like, you know, when you're in Panama and you're just wandering around and then you're like, all of a sudden you're like separated from your group and you're around a bunch of people and they're just got this capability or this confidence that people can read off of you. Um, and I guess what I would say about that is, Sean, like when I was younger, when my uncles or people would say things, I didn't have the confidence or the strength to say no to them. No, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to go to that place. No, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. After a certain time, martial arts gave me the confidence to just say, no, I'm not going to do that. And know that I had the, the intestinal fortitude to back it up. Right. And that's why people say to me a lot of times, why are you so confident? How can you go into the board of governors meeting at the university of Waterloo and deliver that speech with such confidence and be so convicted about what you're saying, it's because of martial arts, right? It just gives you this thing that other people don't have because I guess, I don't know, Richard Kim said it. That's the final arbitrator, right? And when you know you got the final arbitrator on your side, it makes everything else a little easier, I think. <laughs> um, before we go to Hanshi, I want to touch on one thing you just talked about, you know, the idea of boundaries. And uh, in my recovery circles, we have a great phrase, without my no's, my yeses don't mean anything. And uh, I found that in martial arts too. Hanchi Legacy, what about you? What, what, is, what is this as a mental health thing or as a way to get busy living? What, what does it offer non-physically that way? Well, for me, you know, having an idle mind sometimes lets in things that you don't want to. So there was a, a part one time in my martial arts where I was just a little tired and I I slacked off a little bit then I I think I'm not sure I still don't know but I thought I, I was getting a bit depressed I would have weird nightmares and I I was didn't like my days nothing like that and so it went on for about two weeks and I thought oh dear I think you're getting depressed and you're gonna lose it so uh when I used to teach at the university, which I did for 35 years, you know that. Um, during the it was during the summertime. I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't working out as much as I I could. So I I decided to go in every day into the gym at Old House College there and do my entire program every day. Every day I went back to my program. You know, within um, five or ten days. Uh, it was gone. It was gone. I just think that something was seeping in because I wasn't filling my mind up with good things and my body and that. And I'm not a doctor, so and that's the only time I ever had anything happen to me like that. So I'm just telling you so you can make your own decision on on that. So when your body your mind and spirit are in harmony. And then when you start going off a little bit, it's almost like a type of not, not being well or not a wellness, you know, because you're so accustomed to being that way. You're the best you can be. And then all of a sudden you start breaking down, then that feels odd to you. 
at least it did to me. And like Sensi Suino, I also love martial arts. And uh, I like what he said, but I'm gonna say, it saved my life literally from where I was going before to where I am now. That's all I can tell you. Then. Um, I also could talk about this for hours. I could do an hour and a half on this and, and never, it's all I care about is mental health because without it, you're not going to get out of bed and do the physical stuff. Um, it, I just, I know, I know too many people, including myself who've been through depression. And the thing about depression is to the outside, someone just goes, well, just get up and put on classical music and walk in the woods. You won't be depressed after that. It's like, yeah, I can't get there. That, that the bridge of getting there is where depression puts up its wall. And I know for me, I've talked about this a little on the show, but I know, cause I used to, and for people who are watching and don't know this, be an intravenous drug user. And I used to lie in bed with my heartbeat at about 210 beats a minute. And I was pretty sure I was gonna go over the edge into an overdose. And I would breathe in bed through my first five kata as a way to slow my heart rate. I wouldn't do my kata. I, I I'd lost that capability at that time. Um, but I could breathe and quietly put myself in a place where it's a bit of what you're talking about, Hanshi Legacy, where I knew what the good thing was. And the good thing included a way to breathe. And I know that it saved my life at least five nights that way. But more importantly, because that's not ancient history, but that is history for me. You know, I work in the arts. And I know so many artists who, when they're not hired and somebody else is giving them the validation and the thing that makes them seen and needed, get depressed and don't know what to do with their lives. And so now you've got a life where you're powerless um, because you're waiting on a phone call that may or may not come. When I don't book an acting job, my buddy Luke Humphrey, who's one of my JITS friends and a really talented actor, we laugh about this. We're like, we've literally hit a place where we're happy when we don't get a gig. The gig's great. We need the gigs or else we're not doing the thing. But when we don't get the gig and the other guy gets it, we're like, oh, thank God I can go grapple. I can go fight. My first calls to Alden, like, hey, tonight's a fight class. Bring your gear. Like, it's my joy when I'm not working and no one's phoning me because of martial arts is as great. If not, I'd even argue with the passing years greater than when I'm on set doing that other thing. And I spent those difficult years only defining myself as that one thing and it wasn't healthy and martial arts give i wrote down day to day it gives me a day to day intense desire intense roadmap i know why i'm eating what i'm eating i know why tomorrow i'm getting a massage and not going to the noon class because of saturday's tournament like it just gives that insight out sense and sense it oh i'll just put a button with this you and i were driving in the 90s in my honda crx and you talked about maybe an uncle of yours or someone who had a heart thing and you just said like when you get to know your body from the inside out the way we do, you see the warning signs earlier. And it's not impossible, but it's unlikely that something like that's going to have disastrous results. And Hanchi Legacy, I think you proved that with your own experience. Yeah, if you, that, that conversation was when it was my dad's best friend and he had had a heart attack. And he was, we were talking about martial arts. I'm just going to go quickly. And I said, uh, yeah, you know, every night when you lay down, I know where my bumps and bruises come from. Like when I lay down in bed, my knee is sore and, you know, my neck is a little bit gurked up or my hand hurts. I know what I punched. I know who squeezed my neck. I know who swept me. And I do that often. We all do that. We all know. Yeah. We're... And he said, oh, so you're telling me that uh, had I just paid attention the night before I had my heart attack, I would have known. And I said, no, because for like a decade before that, you hadn't paid attention and you were just used to feeling shitty, like feeling shitty felt normal to you. Right. And so then you had the heart attack and there was no chance for you to know that something was weird because you were just used to feeling like crap. You just were used to it. So that was that story. But Yep. I love that. There's a point where it's a little too late. You, you didn't um, stack the hay bales soon enough, you know, for the, for the fall harvest to, to be fruitful. And that's the one thing, you know, so many of our guests, you know, a lot of them don't have regrets, but the ones who do, the word for me that comes up with every single one of them is time. 
everybody's regret is time. I wish I'd banked more sooner. Look Even at the legacy had a regret. He said he wished he picked a different movie star. <laughs> as his as the favorite. <laughs> I, I picked the best one. <laughs> uh um, on the, uh, you know, the mental health stuff is important, but the physical stuff too. I mean, look at the gifts we get from a lifetime of staying, staying physical. I just went through a exam for life insurance and it was ridiculous. It's like, man, am I blessed? You know, what a nice side effect of all this hard physical work over the years. You know, the, the, all the numbers are ridiculous for somebody my age. It's pretty cool. You know, and it's just the result of, you know, training five, six days a week for, you know, decade upon decade. You just did all your blood work since the funeral, and you're hoping that you're going to get put on TRT. And then they were like, sorry, you should be donating testosterone. To <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I could still use a little more, but, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was gratified. Shall we say that they said I was in the middle range for people, uh, between the ages of whatever it was, 28 and 39. Uh, even though I'm more than twice some of those ages. Uh, yeah, you know, it's just a nice, it's a nice benefit. I mean, we probably have more connective tissue damage than people that don't do martial arts. Uh, but, uh, you know, you get used to, you get used to walking around with chronic pain, at least the heart's still beating, right? Was it Sensei Tony who said, you know, lift heavy things and breathe deep? That was his prescription, right? Like what an incredibly simple, and we know it's medically sound. Um, so let's let's jump into that. Let's jump into the fact that, you know, none of us have ever said, let's uh, put a needle in our ass, but I have no judgment against anyone who does. I really don't, um, especially in the grappling community. Drugs are so prevalent and God, would it be nice to just go fuck it? I'm going to do two cycles and just beast up for a moment, but but we don't. And again, I, I personally don't judge anyone who does, but let's start with you, Sensei Dofa. What do you think of that as a personal choice and what do you think of that as a competitive choice as a personal choice i have no problem with it as a competitive choice i think you're a cheater um period i think uh there's reasons why you shouldn't do that right um in the competition realm because not everybody has access to that they don't have the same resources i mean if we just wanted to do a pure drug Olympics where there was one doctor who just said, everybody who walks in, we're jamming you in the ass with this, we're monitoring you, we're doing this stuff. I think I would be okay with it, but because it's the wild West, I'm not okay with it. I, uh, especially for things like running, fighting, lifting. I mean, I don't really care about professional bodybuilding. If you want to do that, um, because I think you have a genetic predisposition to be that way and people are doing it. Um, but when it comes to health, that's a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I do think that uh, testosterone um, has been vilified uh, for people who you're cheaters. But one thing I would say is that, you know, a different type of uh, hormone like estrogen Oftentimes ladies are given estrogen and it helps them to live more normal lives. And I think as far as your health goes, if you go to a doctor and they say, yeah, you need to take some testosterone, it's going to make your life better. You're going to get, you're going to recover more. You're going to have more energy. You're going to feel better. Like I'm really interested in some of that stuff for personal well-being um, in the the quality of your life, let's say. I guess I'm against it as uh, something that's going to help you win a plastic trophy. Um, but then, you know, Sean, honestly, I guess you can have two opinions in your mind and see value in both of them. So, yep. you know, if somebody's going to say like, hey, you could make a hundred million dollars and that's going to change um, the direction of your life if you do this. But I don't know, that's at somebody else's expense, right? Like you're doing that, you're dominating some other person to do that. Yeah. I don't know. I just think if you do that, you're cheating. In a, yeah. Especially in a sport where they say you shouldn't do it. You can't do it. The rules say you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Suino, what about you? Where do you go with drugs for personal or for professional? What, what's your take on all that? 
Uh, you mean uh, 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 like anabolic steroids? When yeah, you say basically drugs. performance enhancing, that kind of thing. The juice. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I add, can add a lot to what Randy said. I think in professional bodybuilding, it's so accepted. And um, that's kind of the stage you're on, right? It's not like they're doing arm wrestling or it's not the Tour de France, right? Look what mm -hmm. happens when somebody has a, a really complicated chemical regimen and wins the Tour de France year after year after year after year and denies it and denies it and denies it. And then in order to support that, has to throw so many other people under the bus, has to lie so many times, accuse other people of bad things, right? Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not just cheating. It ends up becoming a way of life, right? The cheating part of that. I mean, that was yeah. for a guy who did so many good things. Uh, Lance Armstrong was also just a horrendous human being for many, many years you know, for decades. And um, uh, uh, it may be the case that there are some places for it, like I say, in professional bodybuilding. Mm. But uh, my favorite guy in grappling is Mikey Musumichi. And he not only is a skinny little turd, uh, he, he is an outspoken uh, opponent of steroids. And he's one of the best grapplers out there. Like that's inspirational, right? Yep. It is inspirational. You know, it's funny you mentioned Lance because that's where I was going to go with it because that is $100 million he got. And Sensei Dauphin, when you talked about it, I, I mean, everybody goes, oh, cycling, they were all cheating in that era. And they were. You'd have to go to like 23rd place before there's someone who didn't pop at some race somewhere. But it then becomes who's best at the drugs because like you said, Sensei Dauphin, it's not, everybody's not getting the same protocol. So now it's who's got the best doctor, who's got the best whatever. And I'm with you, Sensei Suino, 100%. Lance Armstrong's ride up Sestriere. If you're a cycling person, you know what I'm talking about. In 1999, when he was leaving guys in the dust uphill it, at an un, like an incredible accelerator rate, I still watch that. And Sensei Dauphin, you said you could have two ideas. I think he proved himself to be dreadful, but I can still watch that ride and get inspiration from it when I'm in the basement pounding weights. And but he destroyed people's lives to maintain the lie. It wasn't just I'm lying and I'm better at drugs. It's that and even his apologies, he couldn't overtly apologize on Oprah because of lawsuits. So he had to talk around just saying, hey, Betsy Andrew, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too hard, but I'm sorry because he couldn't say that because that would be an admission and cost him 40 million dollars or whatever. So, yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, the IBJJF, the, the Jiu Jitsu fan, they don't drug test. So it becomes arguable that they're kind of saying, show up how you want to show up. Yeah, dude, if they if it's not written into the rules, then be Gordon Ryan. Like, take whatever cocktail you want, get as huge <laughs> as you want. Everybody else can do that too. That's not part of the rules. If you're in pride, I know in the pride contracts, it was, we. it said, we will not drug test you. <laughs> it said that in the... <laughs> right but in the UFC, in the ufc they say no we're drug free and so then you look at a lot of those athletes before they said you yeah and after look at alistair Overeem. look at what Overeem looked like um when he was allowed to be on his cocktail and when they said no you're off and look yep. at his record before and look at his record after yep. right yep and if the rules say you can't do it and you do it then you're cheating lance yep. armstrong was a cheater because the rules said you couldn't do it. And he did it. He's a cheater. Um, Hanchi Legacy, what about you? And also, I just want to add, I mean, back in the 70s, you know, I'm just thinking about the bodybuilding era. Like, no one even cared. Like, it was just like, here, try these pills. Try this horse hormone. Like, was any of that in the fighting world? Or was it not something? Uh, not with me. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to take a different angle on it. Because you guys pretty well covered everything is that. You're not moving mankind forward, right? Just the humans, the way we were created by the creator, whoever it is. Um, you're not getting gaining any achievements. You know, it's the drug is doing it. You're not doing it. So you can't really judge how good you're improving. And um, you, your training goes downhill because a lot of the times you rely on some substance to get you there. And in the classical arts, you know, we, we're, consider, we're, consider, we're considering human beings and training them. And when they look at you, you're supposed to be some type of a, a model, a role model. 
And if you do that, it's like, geez, I hated when you guys, when uh, Randy said, you're a cheater, like that, that, that rubbed me the wrong way. It's just like somebody scratching my chest with pieces of broken glass. Just, yeah. You know, this might, be, go ahead, go ahead. Be, we're supposed to be moving mankind forward. We're martial artists. The artists of what? Life, right? And if you, if you cheat, um, you're not doing yourself any good and you're not doing mankind any good. And, and another thing I wanted to say was, just imagine eh, when human beings, like one time it was a uh, guy ran 100 yards in eight seconds. And then later on it was, seven and a half seconds and then more and more. Where is this gonna stop? If this guy could run, say, let's just say hypothetically five seconds, they'll say, oh, nobody will ever beat that. But what if a guy trained harder? Mm. What if he, could he beat that? I mean, somebody did it. And then when he beats that, you need people to try to beat that. So you're moving my, uh, mankind forward, our species forward, instead of, making them cheaters and many underachievers. So um, you're gonna do drugs, do it at home with behind closed doors, but don't bring it out into the world of competition and somebody with pride and, and maybe even martial arts. Uh, if it's okay, I wouldn't mind jumping in, but Sensei Suino, I think you have a thought, yeah? Uh yeah, and then um, uh, Christiana sent a, a a quote to me that I want to read and, and get to. But let's 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 uh, wrap this up. I just love what Hanchi said about you know if you're if you're using performance enhancing drugs and you have a victory, is it really your victory? I don't think it is. You go to bed that night knowing that you won with that. But imagine, as you said, Hanchi, you're you set a new record for the hundred yard dash, hundred meter run. And it's all because you just trained your ass off. You did more thinking than the other mm. person, right? That's a true victory. As you said, it moves mankind forward. The other one is uh, is hollow. And you have to sleep the rest of your life knowing that you you did that, right? It's just not, it's just not the same. There's no, the $100 million can't pay for that. Um, I just wanted to throw out two quick ideas that you really got me excited about, Hanshi. The first is just, you know, they said the four-minute mile was undoable. Like scientifically, guys were like, it's impossible. And then when Roger Bannister beat it that summer, two more guys beat it. And that to me is moving mankind forward, like you said. Like literally a mental barrier got broken. And then people have been running sub four minute miles. Like high school kids could do it now. Like it's one of those things where that's not about drugs or cheating. That's about like, go again, go again. We think it's there, we think it's there. And I just love that story of the mental barrier breaking not the he found the right drug barrier breaking but the deeper one for me and i just wanted to use a bit of my career like a lot of people in show business will re they'll get hair plugs they'll get botox and i'm talking about men they'll dye their hair all the time and those have all been available to me like i've thought about it and i just thought do, yeah, I you should do all of those things sean you should do thinking all about of it i'm thinking about <laughs> it um and I'll do the, you know, I want, I want to get that Marvel three picture deal and, you know, just be on the cover of men, men's fitness in like three months jacked from the Marvel diet, which is everybody calls the local, you know, trend dealer. But no, um, when I think about what you said, Hanchi, about the, 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 the martial art, the reason I chose not to do those things is I want to be a 48 year old. I want to be a fit. I want to experience the Zen journey of aging through this body as this body ages while being the best I can on any given day. And I even think about something you helped me with Sensei Dofan when I was like, I talk about Alden a lot, you know, man, I'm having trouble keeping ahead of him. And you're like, it's not your job. It's your job to make him the best he can be. And I think about that is the wisdom I get over my training. It's not about shooting up some drugs so I can run faster and, and try and then beat the big guy who's 15 years younger than me. And so I look forward to being a 60 year old martial artist and knowing what that person knows that I can't know yet as a function of walking it the way I am, not the way I think I should be. And that for me is something that this art, these arts have given me, which is acceptance of who I am on any given day, 
and then knowing what I can do on any given day based on that. It's um, it's the greatest gift I think I've gotten is the Zen path. What's that question, Sensei Suino? So it's a it's a quote Christiana sent in, and it's a quote that's been going around social. Um, I just glanced at some of the comments on it. There's people all over the map on this, but it kind of relates to a lot of stuff we we have talked about, and you guys have probably heard this. The quote is: "Obesity, obesity is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your heart." Being in debt is hard. Being financially disciplined is hard. Choose your heart. Communication is hard. Not communicating is hard. Choose your heart. Life will never be easy. It will always be hard, but we can choose our heart. Pick wisely. We can kick that around a little bit. Who do you go to first, says this, you know? We go to you, Randy. I like the heart that builds you up and not tears you down. Right. So if you have to choose a hard, choose the one that's going to, uh, what Sensei Legacy said, choose the hard that's going to move society forward, move the world forward. Right. Choose the hard that's, if you're the best you can be, and you pull people around you who then, and that you don't have to be the best at everything. Like if you suck at, balancing your checkbook then just understand that you suck at that and if you don't work in the area that you suck at you're never going to be as good as you can be and there's people around that are awesome at it that you can look up to get help from that are going to help you do those things um so i just think you know i mean man i don't want to be like a person who like I know some people are in debt for real reasons outside of their control. I know some people are overweight for real reasons that are outside of their control. Um, so I'm not trying to say to those people, oh man, it's just easy. Uh, I, you chose, you didn't, they didn't choose their heart, I guess, right? But if you have a choice, choose the thing that's gonna like move everything forward, not the thing that's gonna move you backwards. That's what I take, right? Love it. What do you say, Sean? I've been both. I've been both. I was 35 years old. I was $60,000 in debt and I had no job and no income. Like, like I, I just, I, I'd recovered spiritually from all the stuff I put myself through, but I hadn't recovered financially, let's say. And I'm just using this as an example because I know all the other examples. <laughs> but this one for me is, it is hard to be financially prudent. It is hard to properly gauge and know what the right amount to spend is. And I'm, I, I have a, a fluctuating income. So I have to get really wise about amortizing what the year functionally looks like and not get crazy when there's heights and not get freaked out when there's lows. And I've spent 10 years creating a living, breathing, working budget for myself that's constantly changing, but works. And it takes discipline and rigor. And every Monday, I spend one to two hours budgeting, et cetera, et cetera. But what's harder is getting that notice in the mail and not opening it and having, I call it the app running in the background, right? We know our phone's battery drains when you have apps running in the background, even if you're not using them. And the app running in the background that knows you have a stack of mail, the app running in the background that knows you, you haven't eaten well in a month. I find that to be much harder. And that's not on paper. That's through experience. It's draining the adrenal system. It's, it's draining everything that could lead to the potential. It's this quiet upper limit problem going, yeah, you're not a guy who's worth the tax problems of a millionaire. So don't get too rich. Well, I want to have the tax problems of a millionaire. And like Sensei Dolphin said, at that point, I won't know the answers, but I'll know who to hire who has the answers. And that'll cost money and et cetera. But it'll be quality problems, you know? And that's one thing I've learned to really enjoy is quality problems. Rebuilding a knee as a healthy guy who trains martial arts every day was a quality problem. And I know what it's like to have a body that's failing for the wrong reasons or a body that's a little tweaked for the right reasons. The one seems easier on a random Tuesday, even if you're hungover, but the other one's easier because you're conscious through it all. And yeah, I choose your heart. I, I, I've never heard that quote. And I'm going to start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feather that into the mantra and the meditations. 
What do you think, Hanchi? Life will never be easy. It will always be hard, but we can choose our hard. Well, I, I that's a good, I like that. That's a good saying. But uh, to choose your heart, make sure that your heart is attainable because it'll end in defeat, right? If you take too big of a bite, you're going to end up choking with it. So take baby steps or small steps, but still train hard and be moving forward. Instead of taking one, one big hard step that you, you can't achieve all at once, take a bunch of small steps, steps and gain that ground. With, within your capabilities or build your capabilities up and gain more ground now. So don't take big bites, just take what you can so that you don't fail. I think that, you know, a lot of people give up because they, they take uh, on too much and they, they defeat themselves and trying to think that they're gonna gain this easily and then leads to a downfall. So yes, always challenge yourself, but always challenge yourself within your capabilities or you'll sort of self-destroy. Yeah, that, I love how, yeah, I love how that reframes the, the challenge and it, it, it's spoken like a martial artist, right? Oh yeah, I wanna be a black belt. Well, what should you do? Show up today at the dojo, right? Oh, I don't feel like working out. You know, that's okay. Let's bow in and start training. You know, uh, I'm exhausted. Do one more kata. You know, uh, we do that on such a daily basis in the martial arts. Just do that one small thing. The 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 black belt, right? The lifetime path of martial arts, just accumulation of small effort over time. Okay. But That's on that, it's just, you know, if somebody walks in tonight to any of our clubs and has never trained and said, I want to fight you. <laughs> they're biting off a little too much right they're, like, they're choosing they're choosing too much hard too fast <laughs> <laughs> that's why people mostly quit martial arts because they expect themselves to boom be a black belt in like six months or in some dojos they do unfortunately and that lets out the bad word but that's why people quit because they take too big a bite let's be a yellow belt first and then that's why there are different belt levels to sort of give you that ability to know what to choose. And we set, we set that as uh, manservants or servants, martial arts. How about you, Census Fino? Answer your own question. <laughs> well, you know that, something you and I talk about all the time, maybe with not those words. Um, always choose it, right? Choose the challenge. And... Um, but it's a process, isn't it? I mean, we do, you know, it, that's a that's a great quote. And it makes you feel inspired and you want to go out and work hard. But the daily balancing of that is mm. a little bit different, right? Oh, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to go to Japan in nine months and train in five different places. Okay, well, to make that happen, you're going to do a whole bunch of tasks in the meantime, right? Wow. To make sure that logistically you're there, you got the money, you're trained for it, right? You're in shape for it. You got all this kind of stuff. Um, it's the same thing on our path in the martial arts, right? Oh, I want to be a black belt. What are you going to do? Well, I know I got to show up at the dojo. I got to train. I want to be better than I am now. Okay, well, I'm going to add some weightlifting in there. I want to be better. So I'm going to add some, some uh, nutrition in there, right? I'm going to study my sleep. I'm going to do the cold plunge. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a process. But I guarantee one thing, I don't know why I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, uh, I guarantee one thing, if you don't take those steps, you're not only going to be right where you were in nine months, but you're going to be uh, nine months older and you'll have lost those nine months, right? You'll be older, closer to death, and probably broken down a little bit more. But if you have those projects, even though they're hard, and even if you got to balance all the stuff, you're going to you're at least going to have those victories. You're going to be a better human being. Your character is going to be, have developed. So by choosing hard, it's not always a dramatic choice, but it ends up with vastly different outcomes over the long term. I always say, you know, martial arts will. So if you don't train hard, if you don't do it properly, martial arts will pick you up, chew you up, and spit you back out into the street. And then you'll be twice as bad, worse off, because you'll also, also realize you don't have the intestinal fortitude to do what some people do. You're one of those quitters or losers as far as that goes. <laughs> This is this is the cheaters, quitters, and losers conversation tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's that's the that's the undertow of it. 
you know, yeah, it's nice to go in swimming, but there's always an undertow, right? Um, That's why more people fail than succeed in martial arts. Sensei Dofe, you and I have talked about this a lot. In my experience, there's two things that every guy will talk to you about when you either have some martial arts gear on you. Oh, I used to do martial arts or a motorbike helmet. Oh, I used to ride. And it's like, how's that working out for you? Like, is your life better not riding a motorcycle <laughs> or is your life better not doing this stuff? And I remember being in LA, I was a white belt and I had, I, it's funny because I'm blending the two ideas, but I had burnt my leg on my exhaust. I ride in shorts way too often and I was doing some grappling and I had to like tape where the skin, the burnt skin was sloughing off or whatever. And the teacher after goes, how's your training going? And I said, it's tough. Like I popped a rib. I hurt my fingers. I got this leg thing. And he just goes, he was a Brazilian guy. He goes, this is designed to make you quit. The whole thing is designed to make you quit. Just don't quit. And he meant it both big picture, but also the, like if you play soccer, your goal is to put the ball in the net and you might tear an ACL trying to put a ball in a net. But in martial arts, the other guy's trying to tear your ACL. The other guy's trying to crack your rib. Like that's the whole point of it. Uh, aside from the spiritual stuff we're talking about. And so it's literally designed to make you quit over your lifetime or quit in the conflict. And I love what he said. He goes, just don't quit. Listen, stop trying to make it sound so dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> He's an actor. <laughs> yeah, right. perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. But I know all the injuries in the other sports are incidental. They're not the point. Yeah, and that teacher that was talking to you about that, um, should have quit many times. Born with a birth defect that would suggest that they never should have been at the level that they're at right now, which is in the top like 0.1% of the world in BJJ. <laughs> yeah. Like just for people listening, that's Jean-Jacques Machado and he's born with his hand that basically has this. And this is a gripping art. This is an art where the point is to grab and control the other person. And he just went, that's okay. I'll, I'll figure out another way to do it. And his overhook game is the best in the world. And um, yeah, it's, uh, well, we talked about that with Bill Superfoot Wallace too, right? Where the injury becomes the roadmap to the success. Yes. But but that's, I, yep. I saw him fight, um, geez, I forget who it is now. I was watching him on YouTube the other day, fighting, I um, forgot his name, sorry, I forgot it. I'll just pass on it. Super, Super Football was, was a good fighter. I watched him fight against, who is that heavyweight fighter that he fought against? You remember? Joe Lewis. Pardon? Joe Lewis, he fought Joe oh, Lewis. Joe Lewis, that's right. I was watching him fight Joe Lewis the other day. What an incredible guy. He only had, he only used one leg. You know, he had one leg that he messed up doing something. I mean, Superfoot Wallace, and he was an amazing guy. He kicked uh, Joe Lewis in the head three times before he landed a punch. He was an amazing guy. Yeah, he was on uh, our show. And yeah. Yeah. he, he uh, wrecked his knee doing judo. Should never do judo. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's payback, says the screener, for you saying that judo is the deadliest martial art, right? So, <laughs> um, uh, and but then he showed up with his knee in a cast and started doing karate in Okinawa because he was a soldier. And that's uh, Shoren Rugai, too, by the way. FYI, Shoren Rugai. Yeah. Well, that tells you something about his character, right? Shows up with a cast on his leg. Still trains, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we got like five, six, seven minutes. Um, do we want to talk about any of this stuff coming up in our lives? Yes. Said so, Sweeno, what do you want to talk about? Uh, man, we got stuff going out until almost till next summer, so <laughs> we can talk a long time, but um uh the most obvious thing that's coming up in my life and your life randy is that we're going to tokyo in a couple of weeks 
mm. along with uh, Daniel J. Hall III, who's on this call, and a few other people. And we're going to be there for a long week and uh, have six different martial arts experiences. And uh, it's going to be cool. <laughs> I'm looking forward to outside of the, the martial arts experiences, eating sushi and ramen and Asahi beer um, <laughs> and those rice balls from 7-Eleven. If you've never had them, you've never lived. <laughs> yeah. Lived on those over there. Yeah. Since so Lacey, what are you doing tomorrow night? I'm going to the Montreal Forum to watch the Habs play against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And you're going with a former student, right? You're a former student. Born so. with a former student, Black Belt, whose son is, uh, what is his first name? I forgot. His name Owen. is Beck. Owen Beck. Owen yeah. Beck. He's number 62 for the Montreal Canadiens. And we're going to have this nice little place, special place for uh, the wives and uh, the players' friends. And then after, we're going to meet with uh, uh, the players of the Montreal team. It's going to be wow. hot. Amazing. Yeah. I'm jealous and excited since I am. <laughs> Me I'm too. Jealous. I'm jealous that you're going, but I'm super, super excited and happy for you that uh, that's happening. Yeah. Randy once said to me, well, what's the, he said, our crest is probably the best crest that I, uh, that I cherish my entire life. I said to him, it may be my second. <laughs> <laughs> so, cause you know, I, I met Jacques Plante. If you don't know who he is, well, too bad. Yeah. I met Jacques you Plante. Really, you should go kill school. yourself if you don't know who Jacques Plante is. <laughs> <laughs> he invented for the uninitiated, he invented the mask. And he was a Montreal goalie. I met him when I was six years old in Rimouski, Quebec, playing for a junior team there. My sister brought me to a game. And I never looked back. It was great. I'd forgotten until you just mentioned it. Benson, what's coming up in your life that you're excited about? Well, I just want to say real quick, you know, I'm a Porsche guy and I love that crest, but it doesn't mean anything to me. I only got one crest. That <laughs> um, I really do. It's the only one that matters to me. Um, the uh, the weekend on Saturday, I'm competing. And I just want to talk for two secs. You know, I decided not to cut weight for it, but I also I realized that I, I still get a little tight before these tournaments because it's newer to me, not, not karate. I've done that a lot. And so I chose to treat this week like any other week, just do the normal workouts, the normal classes, the normal things. And I messaged Mike Sheehan, a Team Canada member and one of my coaches. And I was like, am I making a mistake here? Like, should I be more focused? And he goes, brother, if you can go in there and have fun and flow, your skill level is your skill level. But unlocking the skill level will come from the fun and the flow. So all my martial arts lately, including the stand-up and the way I'm teaching my students, I'm really working on, yeah, your technique's got to be there, but have fun in there. When those lungs start to go and those forearms start to go, be like, I want to be, this is where I want to be. And there's the Joe Himes book, uh, Zen and the Martial Arts. There's a passage where he talks about you know, when you're hitting a makawara or a bag and your knuckles are getting shitty, like picture yourself in Hawaii or whatever. It's one of the only things in that book that I, as like a white belt, disagreed with where I was like, I want to be there. Like, I want to experience that, even if I don't love it. And so that's kind of what I'm getting back to for this, this idea. Um, and then I am, you know, I, I Sensei Sweeney, you don't even know that I had bookmarked possibly last minute flying to join you guys. But um, I'm shooting a movie for the next three weeks, Ooh. which I'm super excited about. It's a Canadian only film. So the strike didn't affect it. And then I'm just stoked for Capital Conquest. I had one of the best martial arts like gr groups, in independent of training, times ever at that event last year. Um, I loved being in that city. I loved um, the exposure that this show has given me to so many people that I could then meet in person for the first time. Um, I can't wait to just pick my mat every hour and see what I want to touch on and taste. Um, that's as far ahead as I've really thought, to be honest. And then... Uh, this is a little more personal, not related to martial arts, but the actor strike looked like it's going to close up next week, which if it does would put me back into Calgary for November and December, which will be a little less hardcore stuff, but a lot more of 
the other stuff. Uh, me and my coach came up with the idea there's shooting season when I'm acting and there's fighting season when I'm not. And those are the two seasons of my life. So right now it's fighting season until uh, the strike ends. And I'm really happy for both. What about you, Sensei Dauphin? Listen, I took a new job at the university. I'm really enjoying it. So um, I've I've always felt blessed for the last 20 years that when I get up in the morning, I get to go to work in a place where I'm excited to go, right? So I'm, and I'm more excited now. It's really nice to be working in the role that I'm in. Um, I'm looking forward to this weekend. Uh, Christine and I were talking about it. I'm really Listen, uh, for me, when I compete, if I can like tear somebody's arm off in the first two seconds, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and mostly because I just want to get to watching you and Robert and Madison and Calvin. It's about that team. I just really want to see everybody doing good. I want to I want to watch and be excited for everybody. And uh, I know you guys are going to do great. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm obviously really pumped to go back to Japan like I'd be lying if I I've been there now uh, a number of times and uh, I've been with Sense Legacy I've been with Sense Suino I'm looking forward to going back I'm looking forward to going to the gravesite of the 47 Ronin like I always like the history stuff we're gonna go to uh, the National Sword Museum and Paul Martin another person who's been on this show and we're gonna he's a foremost authority in the the sword in the world and it's gonna be super cool to just get a behind the scenes tour of some things and then have a drink with the guy and just meet him for real. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm blessed. My life is great. I got, got no complaints about anything right now. <laughs> Nothing. Love that. My life is. Yep. I can't wait for Saturday. You know, you messaged me a while ago and said, you know, it'd be a real nice thing if we just all compete together. And I just love that. And I'm super stoked to, to cheer you on and, and be cheered on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our PKCC crew, Robert Shlumsky, Justin Shea, Andre Sedeshev, Alden Adair, Jesse Blevitao, Sidney Dauphin, Josh Kitchens, Christiana Landolt, Daniel J. Holland, Dridi Guliani, and Stavros Stavroulias. We don't have a show without them, and you don't know what our shows are without them because they run all that stuff that lets you know what's up. And I want to tell you that next week, we're here at the same bad time, same bad channel, and assuming his computer works, we're going to be chatting with uh, Calvin Chong, which we're super stoked about. And thanks for, for hanging with us tonight. You know, what a beautiful impromptu uh, host chat. And um, I don't want the last word, Hanchi Legacy. Why don't you give us the last word before we say goodnight? I have nothing to say. No kidding. I'm just too relaxed right now. Beautiful. Hey, Ben, yeah. Sensei Copeland, we'll give him the last word. He said... Great. Good luck on the weekend to all of you, right? So let's uh, let Sensei Copeland have the last word. Thanks, Sensei. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Sensei. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>